Hey everybody, Chris here again. Welcome back to the channel. Always good to have you with us. So today, I am excited to show you an original RetroTech Chris creation. That's right. I've been doing some programming in MS-DOS and I have written a TSR that allows us to receive push notifications in MS-DOS. And albeit that it's a terribly written TSR, we're still going to look at it <laughs> because this is a pretty cool capability. So we'll do a couple of things. First, we're going to have a look at how to build this application and then I'll give you a demonstration. After that, we're going to take a source code tour. Feel free to skip that section if you find it boring. It's a lot of going through C code, but I thought I'd put it out there just in case you find it interesting. Hopefully it doesn't put you asleep. From there, as I mentioned, since it is a terrible little program, I'm gonna tell you about five ways that I think that it can be improved. And then from there, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. So that's pretty much the story. Let's get started. So to build the program, there's really three steps. Two are downloading compiler tools, and the third is actually building the program. So first, we're gonna go ahead and download the NASM assembler, and we can navigate to the website here, and we can download version 2.15.05, and I want the Windows 64-bit version for that. So we'll go ahead and get that downloaded. And next, we're going to download OpenWatcom, which is a great little C compiler. And we'll go to SourceForge for that. And we need to navigate to the Files section. And then we're going to download version 1.9. This program is not compatible with version 2. We'll skip past the Fortran versions you see there and find the 32-bit Windows C version and go ahead and get that downloaded. Once downloaded, we can proceed to install, and I'll show you the different options that I choose for Open Whatcom. We'll go ahead and accept the agreement and specify a location in a selective install. We want to install 16-bit compilers, and I'm going to enable the huge setting, though we may not be using it. And then for 32-bit compiler options, the defaults are fine. For the target options, we need to select DOS. For the host options, we just need Windows NT slash 95, and that's already selected. And then for other components, we can just select OK, the defaults are fine. So from there, we can go ahead and pop through with Next and Next, and the installer will proceed to install Open Wacom. And it installs pretty fast. It's really not that big of an application. We'll go ahead and let it modify our environment variables for us, since there are some path settings that do need to be set. And with that, we're installed. Next, let's install NASM. Now, as we install NASM and we get to the path where it installs, be sure to copy that to the clipboard. We're going to need to use that later to set an environment variable. So we can hit next from there and go ahead and install. And that'll finish pretty quickly. And now what we can do is go ahead and launch our system environment variable settings so that we can grab the path or set the path for NASM. So I'm going to come down to the system variables and find the path. And you'll see it's actually already there because I've been here, but we'll add it again. It doesn't hurt to add it again. Click OK. Yeah, that's where I have it. Click OK. And then from there, our environment variables are going to be all set. Perfect. So now on to the third step where we launch a command prompt and I go ahead and change into the repository and type wmake. And from there, the executable will build. That simple. All done. Next, we're going to go ahead and run the program. And to do that, it's basically setting up a packet driver and then running the application. So I have a little session here where I've actually gone ahead and set up the packet driver, but we need to get this TSR push over to my little virtual machine. So I've loaded WinImage and created a new floppy, and I'm now going to inject onto that floppy disk the release version of TSR push that we built just a few minutes ago. So we'll find that, go ahead and select it, inject it, and now we can do a file save as, and this is important because you want to save as a non-compressed image, and we can go ahead and put on the desktop just a little floppy image called TSR push. And with that, we can close Win image, pop over to VirtualBox that I have loaded here, and go ahead and load that floppy into the drive. 
And once loaded into the drive, all we need to do is change to drive A, and we can run TSR push, specify the packet driver address and the UDP port, which will be 20,000 for us. And we can see we're loaded and taking up 2,007 and four kilobytes. So from there, we can move on to testing. And for testing, I have a little Python script that we can run. And for simplicity, I'm just gonna run this little Python script on my Raspberry Pi. Here you can see it, it's called send message. And as you can see, it is in the Git repository. So I've copied that to the Raspberry Pi and you can see I run it here and lo and behold, our push message appears at the top of the screen. How cool is that? Perfect. I'll go ahead and clear the screen and you'll see that it does reemerge. And as long as we are in a non graphical setting, we should see it. So next up, we can go ahead and actually unload the TSR. And to do that, we just type TSR push again and it will unload automatically and you'll see it disappear from the top of the screen. That's simple, all set. Next, let's have a look at the source code and we'll start with the include files. You can see there are several here and I'm actually not going to go through them, but did want to show you that we do have several include files that are part of this project. Moving on, we can pop over to the actual source directory and we're gonna go through two of the files that you see here the main file and the handlers file. But you can see there's some other supporting programs as well. And of course, we do have our one test application that we saw briefly for testing and sending messages. And you can see that here. Okay, so moving on, let's go ahead and take a little tour through the source code. And to do that, I'm going to launch TextPad. And first we'll look at the main application. This is the application where when the program starts up, it's going to get called. And we can dive just into this a little bit here and see some of the capabilities that this main application has. First, we do have some static resident function prototypes at the top, as is typical for a C program. And then moving on, we can get to the main method and you'll see some different items here, including a usage statement for people who launch the program and want to know how to go ahead and input those input parameters that you need. And you can see that this main function is also geared towards seeing if the TSR is already loaded. As we saw earlier, when we went to unload it, we had that option to just unload it and it didn't say anymore. Otherwise, if the TSR is not detected in memory, it runs the code block that you see at the bottom here. So let's go ahead and continue scrolling down and looking at the different options in this program. And we'll see here that we have items for finding if that TSR is in memory, as well as checking for other instances that are running. I actually didn't write a lot of that code. I took it from the open watt clock example that is listed in the repository. But you can see here that once we get to the install TSR to memory, we do run our buffer init, which is part of the TCP utilities, as well as actually running the packet init. So those are two applications that I did add into this uh, startup that you see here. Moving on, we can see there's a section for returning to DOS with resident memory, as well as removing the program from memory. So when we run that remove, I also added some logic here to stop the buffer and release the packet driver. And that's what you see there. Moving on, there's some more auxiliary functions for supporting different items that we need to do. Once again, I did not write most of this logic, but you can see that there is a function to remove push notifications from the screen and we saw that happen when we unloaded the TSR earlier. So there's definitely capability to support that. And there's also some capability to print errors because some cases things don't always go as you would expect. And that definitely does happen. I did add some logic down here to this program to go ahead and tell us if there was a problem loading the packet driver so that you can see that there. Perfect. And that's pretty much what I wanted to cover in the main application. Moving over to the handlers, first of all, I must say that this code was heavily reused from Michael Brutman's MTCP. And I actually collaborated with him a little bit on this and he gave some great feedback, most of which you will see in the known issues. There are some pragmas associated with this TSR to ensure that the code and data segments get set to where they need to be. That's very important when dealing with memory management in MS-DOS which in my opinion is otherwise a nightmare. As we move on, we can see that we have a receiver function 
and that's for actually receiving the data. And we'll see there's actually two parts to the receiver function. The first part is basically getting things uh, set up and getting ready to get the buffer. And then from there, we actually take the buffer data and call a function to print the push notification. So we'll look at those uh, methods as well here, or I should say functions. The first one is this packet process internal. And this is basically taking a data packet, trying to decide what it is. Is it an IP packet? And then from there, we do some checks to see if it is a UDP packet. And if it is, then we start to pick things apart. So there you can see where we're checking and actually pulling headers. And we'll actually look at the headers in Wireshark here in a minute. But moving on, here we can see our check for the UDP protocol, as I mentioned. And you can see where I start to pick apart the different headers and pieces of it. And then we can actually check and see and make sure the port is what we expect. When we ran our application, it was supposed to be 20,000. So that's where we do that check. And then from there, we can take the data and actually put it into a little buffer to display it on the screen. And that's what you see there, putting it into that resident data dot data. And after the data is all filled in, the next thing we need to do is actually clear out any sort of additional data that was there before that goes beyond the data we received. So if we only received 40 bytes of data, we want to clear the rest so that we don't show garbage on the screen. So here we are just filling in with blank spaces after we receive the data. And here you can see in Wireshark what things start to look like. I've gone ahead and sent a message like we did before, and you can see the breakdown. There's a variety of different headers. This is a 97 byte frame. You can see ethernet headers. We can see internet protocol headers. So that's an IP header. And then from there, we can get to the point where we have a UDP header as well. And as we look in here, we can see source and destination addresses. And as we look at the UDP payload, you can actually see the data that was sent across that hello world message. So this is kind of a little quick breakdown of what the packet looks like and all the different headers to correlate with the code that we saw. So moving on, we have a function to release the packet when we finish. And we also have some timer functions for doing things like keeping track of a counter, which helps us decide when it's time to redraw the screen. That's what that's all about. And then from there, we check to see if it is time to redraw the screen and we can actually print the push notification to the screen. So that's what that's all about as well. And we need to do that because the user could clear the screen or enter a program and it would get erased. So we have that capability there. So moving down a little bit, we have a DOS to multiplexer. So that's basically some fancy install logic. No, I did not write that. I pretty much copied that. And then we have start and stop receiving, which tells us to basically either process or not process data, which helps with starting up the application or unloading it from memory later. And then moving on, we have a init function here for doing various initialization, setting various variables. That's what that's all about there, getting that packet driver where it needs to be. And then from there, we have a little resident data function as well. And finally, at the end of the program, we have this little function that's going to tell us how big the application is. And by calling it, we can determine that and decide just how much memory we need to allocate for this application. So as you can see, there's a lot that goes into MS-DOS TSR programming. It's really not for the faint of heart. There's things that you have to consider like memory management and keeping parts of the program resident in memory and making sure it doesn't get clobbered and keeping code segments and data segments together and all this fun stuff. And of course, using C or C++, it's very powerful, but it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. This was my first foray into DOS programming. And fortunately, I did get this to be stable, but there's definitely those considerations if you're gonna do MS-DOS programming. Those of us who do modern programming have it a lot easier, as you might imagine, since we don't have to do with these limitations that you otherwise would encounter. So there's that. So now let's look at the five ways that we can approve this application. And actually some of the feedback came from Michael Brutman. Actually, a lot of it did. So, and the funny thing is when I actually wrote this, I knew of these shortcomings. <laughs> But once again, I kind of wanted to make this just a proof of concept and get it going. 
but he also found these, so we have them listed. Let's have a look at the list. So looking at the known issues, the first one is that this will not work with all programs that are resident. It does work with some, it does not work with others. The screen draw is pretty primitive and it could definitely be improved. And if it were improved, then I think that it would work with more applications. Second, after entering protected mode and then leaving it, I've noticed that the new packets do not show up. So it seems like there's some sort of problem with receiving data or something happens with the driver itself. Maybe some sort of reinitialization is needed if we enter those modes. Third, this program does not support ARP, DNS, or TCP. It is fair to say it is not a well-behaved TCP IP program. And the UDP support is actually pretty minimal as well. Uh, we basically take anything we receive on port 20,000 and display it. There's no initialization. There's no assigning an IP address. It's very rudimentary. But these are things that definitely could be improved, especially using other parts of Michael Brutman's application. We could feed that into this and make it much, much better. Fourth, we only support receiving broadcast packets and do not verify the broadcast address. So this goes to what I was saying just a minute ago, that this is not a well-behaved program. No configuration, no IP address. And fifth, we don't send a reply to acknowledge UDP packets, which we really should do. Uh, once again, real basic program, and there's obviously areas for improvement here. So as you can see, there's some work to do. Maybe you have some expertise in this area and have some interest in helping to make it better. If so, you are more than welcome to fork my Git repo, provide some suggestions, create a pull request and send it back in and we'll look at the changes and maybe we can make this better. I'd love to. So if there's any interest, definitely reach out or leave a comment below and we can look at ways to make this better. All right, that's what I had for you today. I had an absolute blast doing this. This is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I thought it would be a really cool concept, the ability to send push messages in MS-DOS. I do look forward to making it better in the future, but that's what we have for now. I hope you enjoyed the video and enjoyed watching it as much as I did making it. Definitely subscribe to the channel. There's more content to come. I've got lots of different things ready to do. Ring that notification bell, you'll be notified when that new content's available. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If not, well, I guess you know what to do. Give it a thumbs down. In any event, that's what I have for you today. It's been great having you along for the journey, as always, and I look forward to seeing you next time. But until then, bye for now.